Hey everyone, welcome to another video. Um, today we want to do some exploring. Um, we did a previous video not so long ago um, talking about, I believe it was investment and you know generally using of waxes. And I kind of called people out in that video, um, particularly professional casting houses who are just committed to using wax models only. They will not touch any of the castable resins that we on this channel like so much. Um, and um, I guess this is kind of a compromise. This is the way I would do it if I was a casting house and I wanted to get into 3D printing, but not make the full commitment to castable resins. So this is not a new idea that I have come up with. This has been around for quite a while, um, but I wanted to explore it. So when Soraya Tech reached out to us about casting their um, cast resin, um, we also started to develop a little bit of a relationship with them, with some dialogue, and we started talking about some of our ideas, and they sent over a couple other bottles of resin, um, namely Soraya Tech Sculpt and Soraya Tech Tenacious. Both of these resins have very different purposes. Um, Sculpt, for example, is really good at high detail stuff, as the name implies, Sculpt. Um, and it also happens to be very high heat. So I was thinking, could I vulcanize one of these prints? Can I put it straight into a rubber mold and get a decent result? I know that quite a few of these 3D printed resins react poorly with RTV, and that is actually a fact with Sculpt. It does not handle RTV very well, but I wanted to see if it could handle rubber, if it was gonna have any kind of reaction with that. Um, the next one was Tenacious. Tenacious is an odd resin to me. Um, the way Soraya markets it is kind of a raw resin. It's one that you can actually add to other kinds of resin to get a different kind of uh, degree of toughness to it. But Tenacious on its own is actually kind of a flexible material. Uh, it's so tough, in fact, that you can bend it, like almost fold it right in half, and it won't break. So I thought, well, let's try using this flexible material and printing a mold. In other words, uh, a negative space is left in the 3D print that we can inject wax into. I think this is very compelling because you can build uh, your models very accurately in CAD, and you don't have to worry about going through um, kind of the risky, slightly dangerous uh, mold cutting process that you have to do with rubber and, and RTV silicon. So that brings us to the partial sponsor of this video, actually, uh, Shaper 3D. We're gonna be doing a quick little tutorial using Shaper 3D on how to make one of these molds. And uh, I hope you enjoy it. I, I really enjoy this software. I've been using it for a number of years, and um, I've just been seeing it grow continually. I actually know of a few features that they're thinking of adding in the near future. So like, this is a very forward thinking software that I think works great for beginners and will definitely keep intermediate users uh, happy. It has a lot of ongoing things that are really, really cool. It works for iPads, which is really, really cool for us because we have the M1 12 inch iPad. We can just you know use this literally anywhere it's really nice. They also have a Mac and Windows version as well. So again, thank you to Shaper 3D for sponsoring this video. Let's get into that tutorial and then we're going to go to the studio and actually use these molds and see how well they turned out. All right, so let's jump into Shaper 3D here. Now this is the workspace as is very similar with many other kinds of CAD programs, um, but we're going to be creating a mold. Now, I've already actually created what I want to end up with, which is something like this. So these are two halves of the mold. Let's flip that around, drag this over, and it should mesh up with the other half perfectly, just like that. Now, we can't really see what's going on, but if I were to change the color here, and just kind of make that semi-transparent, you can see that there is this ring inside. These hollow balls mesh up with the opposite side, and this just keeps everything in line. So this is what we're gonna do. I'm gonna try to show you guys how to make a mold like this. So first of all, we need the design. Let's get rid of these 
and let's bring up a model. So this is the model that I used to make the design. It has a sprue attached, as you can see right there, but overall it's very simple. There's no hollowing on the inside of this ring up in here. It's very simple. Now we have another option as well. This one is virtually identical in every way, except for the fact that it's been hollowed on the inside. Because when it comes to getting the injection wax out of the mold, any little overhangs like this that you can see, those will become a bit of a problem if the resin is not flexible enough. And then just to illustrate something else, this same type of process will work with incredibly detailed models like this lion but we're not gonna start there. We're gonna start with something else first. I believe I got this one off Thingiverse. Uh, seems like a pretty okay model. I mean, it looks pretty um, pixelated or whatever the word is, tessellated, uh, but I mean, it would print fairly well and it should show up quite nicely. I do wonder what this circle is here. It might be for a stone, maybe? Anyway, the point is making a mold out of this type of design is definitely not recommended until we find a resin that we know works. We're just gonna go with something much simpler in this model for now. So let's just get rid of those two and we'll start the design process. Actually, you know what? Let's get rid of this one too, just for now. So let's go to our sketch planes. So I have designed this, mo this mold with a little bit of industry standard in mind. It's not exactly true to industry standard because frankly, these molds are, are all different sizes in industry anyway. So it's really like, what does the design that you're molding require? I've made this one 50 millimeters wide by 60 millimeters long. And then of course the depth of the model is yet to be determined because we don't really know how deep it needs to be. So anyway, let's start with that. 50 by 60, let's make this six millimeters or a quarter inch. Now I'm going to select the whole thing by double tapping, select this little uh, icon there and drag up. And now I have a duplicate. Same thing, two halves of the mold. Uh, something to note with this particular software is as soon as we do the subtraction tool and create that um, negative shape inside the mold, it will turn these blocks into STL files, which means that we will not be able to edit them in this way at all. So we need to make sure that all of our corners are filleted and pretty and everything's nice before we convert this, because as soon as it's done, it's actually done, and we won't be able to use it uh, as a direct 3D model anymore. It'll have to be done as an STL in Nomad Sculpt or ZBrush or something like that, or Mesh Mixer. So now we have our top and bottom halves. We need to create the locking mechanism so that these two halves can go back together. So I'm just gonna loosely draw a ball here We'll make it five mil because if we drag this over, that seems like a pretty good size for these corners. This is very arbitrary. It could be six, it could be seven, whatever you want. It really doesn't matter as long as it works with your design. So this is five millimeter radius, which means that we need to extrude this to, oops, 10 mil. Then we can grab the top and the bottom, fillet that double-ended and create a sphere. We need to make sure that the sphere is exactly halfway up. We need to make sure that that line is right in the middle. Now I'm gonna select that and copy it, drag that over. Alternatively, you could mirror it if you wanted to. And we'll drag these two over now. We'll select them both and put them in the corners. Now we have a pretty solid little thing going here. You know what, let's get rid of that. Let's just hide it for now. Now we have something easier to work with. 
That actually looks like it might be a little bit high. We'll drag those down. And these look like they might be a little bit high up as well. Drag that down. There we go. So now they're in the corners. These are very fine adjustments. As I said, again, very arbitrary. It doesn't matter too much what they are. Now, generally speaking, four corners is enough on a rubber mold. But in this case, I feel like we might need some more uh, on this plane. So let's make these smaller. Uh, we'll go to four mil. Go eight. Drag those down. Exact same process as the corners, except we're just going to kind of be a little bit more uh, liberal with where we put them. So let's say three. Doesn't really matter again. And I'm just loosely lining everything up so that it's all basically straight. Now I'm going to copy this one, bring that over, and that's the one right there. Oh, and we need to make sure that they're actually all on the same plane. So they're all halved. There we go. So this might be considered a little bit of overkill. So let's bring back that hidden half. Because now what we need to do is make sure that all of these create a negative space on this one, this plane, so that everything locks together when we sandwich it like that. To do this, we need to make sure that this entire half is unified, so all of these individual bodies become one. So you select everything, and then go over here on the left side, and we're going to go to Union. And now, when I select this, it's all one piece. And if I were to select this line, now I can do another chamfer on that if I wanted to, or fillet, whichever you prefer. We're not going to do that because it really isn't necessary. Next step is to lower this down so that all of these semispheres now intersect with the top half. Once again, I can show you this. If we turn down that opacity, we can actually see what's happening inside the model. So the next step is the bread and butter, what exactly is going to make this whole thing work. So now that you have your top half intersecting with the bottom, you're going to go to Tools, hit Subtract. You're going to make the top one positive and the bottom one the negative. And what this is going to do is make sure that the semispheres are now negatively represented on our top half. So we can go back to Color, We'll hit matte cap, bring that back to the same color. So now you can see when I drop this in, everything locks together very exactly. Looks good, right? So now we need our actual model, not that one, this one. Now for this, to make this injectable, you're going to have to make sure that your model has a sprue, which is this thing right here. The rod that's actually leading in towards the model. So I'm going to rotate this by 90 degrees and we're going to make sure that this is more or less centered and we'll bring that in so that the cone is just just peeking through just like this. It could be flush if you wanted it to be but I'd rather have an access to it later because uh, when everything's all lined up, sometimes it's hard to select what's buried inside. So let's make sure that this is now actually intersecting exactly the same as last time, about halfway. And then we're going to drop this down, subtract. So what you wanna do is make sure that your mold is the positive and the thing that you're creating the mold of as the negative. Then you hit done. Now what's going to happen, as I said before, this is going to turn into an STL. So if I just go back, you'll notice that all of these construction lines are gone. So as soon as you go through the process, it turns your top and bottom half into an STL file that is no longer modifiable. And now we have our top and bottom mold. And then if you were to arrange these STLs exactly as you see it, making sure that they're on the same plane, so they're all level across the bottom, uh, you would be able to bring this straight into your slicer and um, print these as is. 
and we will print this on the SL1 using Tenacious, and we'll see how well this turns out. So now that we've got the prints done in the Soriatech Sculpt and the Tenacious, um, we're gonna actually put them to the test now. So we've printed this mold as we have just gone through in this whole walkthrough video, and everything looks pretty good. Um, the color has changed a little bit more than I was hoping. Uh, I was kind of hoping more for a glass clear type look, but it is what it is. So I think it's gonna work out well. There's a little bit of warping in the middle particularly, but this is a flexible material, so I don't feel uncomfortable, you know, kind of manhandling it into place. And we will be um, clamping this closed, by the way. So the worst case is that there's a little bit of wax that kind of shoots out around the perimeter, um, but this happens with normal rubber molds as well, um, sometimes, depends on what the design looks like. But let's try and take a rubber mold from the Soriatech Sculpt. Because it's designed to handle about 325 degrees Fahrenheit without breaking down, in theory, it should be able to handle the mold rubber. The mold rubber that we're using is by Castaldo. This is the gold label, particularly. Uh, they do make them in different colors, and they, the colors do mean different things. Um, this one is, uh, it has more natural gum. This rubber has a slightly lower vulcanizing temperature than some of the stiffer ones, so we're gonna go with this. And uh, we'll just pack it like a normal, vulcanized mold in one of these frames, and hopefully it doesn't make a charred, disgusting mess. So follow along as we put together this mold for the Soriatex sculpt, and then we'll put it against the 3D printed Tenacious mold, and we'll see how things go. So I think this experiment has been a pretty good success, frankly. Um, the rubber mold turned out great. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, uh, I was worried about the sculpt reacting with the rubber and maybe not making it cure properly. Um, as I know it does, we, we did this kind of as a separate thing, not part of the video, where I actually printed and sculpt some mold frames because I needed some custom sizes. And it did in fact react with the Freeman Jewel Sill RTV that we use but it did not react with the Castaldo rubber. Now we did get a big bubble on the top, but that's almost entirely to do with the way we did it. Typically what you have is a sprue sticking out the bottom and that helps channel air out under that massive amount of pressure. With no sprue and just a solid object, you're bound to get some bubbles somewhere. However, what did turn out is very, very promising. If you could print one of these models with a sprue in place, that would be amazing. Like this is a very solid resounding success based off what I've seen. And we will almost certainly be pursuing this in the future using Soraya Sculpt. Now the Tenacious on the other hand, this one, it does have certain aspects that worked out really well, but there are others that just, I'm not probably gonna be pursuing this myself. Tenacious is just not flexible enough. We can bend it, but it's a very slow bend and it doesn't really sit perfectly flat against the other model. Um, just, you know, various things about it that I'm not super enthused about using it as the material for this purpose. 
There are other flexibles. Um, we've actually reached out to Apply Labs. They have a, a very nice flexible that we're gonna be trying where they've actually done this exact experiment already. So we've reached out to them. They'll probably be sending us a bottle in the near future and we will revisit this whole idea um, using their resins as well because these are more designed ex towards the exact thing that we're trying to do. So I think if you were to refer to Tenacious, as I said, as, a, as more of a raw resin, if you're doing sculpture or something where you just want to add a little bit of toughness to that, um, please check out their uh, Soraya Tech's Facebook groups because they're really quite useful. Um, there's a lot of like uh, talking about how much to add to certain types of resin for certain effects. So like 10% Tenacious to 90% uh, clear blue to achieve a certain type of thing. I think that's awesome that that's even available at all. So overall, the entire concept works. This injection looks pretty good. Um, it does have a little bit of lines there, but I think that was more to do with the fit. And this concept is perfectly useful. You just have to find the right material for it. This stuff was on the right track, just didn't quite stand up to the mark. So thank you very much for joining us uh, in this video, watching this little experiment. I thought it was really cool. Um, I hope you found it useful and maybe it's something that you can use in your own studio. Um, that's all I really have to say for that. If you're interested in more content like this um, and you like this video, feel free to hit that like button and hit the subscribe because we have a lot of videos coming up uh, featuring very high top tier 3D printer reviews, more castable resins. There's tons of things in the works, so you don't want to miss that. Um, if you're feeling especially generous, check out our merch bar down below. Um, we also have a resin rank list on our website that I encourage you to check out if you're more interested in the castable resin space uh, rather than the wax injection type of space. And if you need more one-on-one -on -one help with these types of projects or anything really related to 3D printing and jewelry making, um, try out our membership program where I can kind of help you guys on a more one-on-one -on -one basis. So I look forward to seeing you there. I will see you guys in the next video.